Welcome to Right on the Money, the weekly talk show with interviews you can use to help you maximize your money and optimize your financial future. Before moving forward with any of the ideas discussed on the show, always consult your financial advisor, insurance professional, or tax consultant. Looking for financial help or a second opinion? We can help you in your search. And now, your host of Right on the Money, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator, Steve Savant. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money in our series on tax-free income from Cash Value Life Insurance. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about how to create a low-cost life insurance policy that can deliver optimal returns with popular platform speaker, asset management expert, and life insurance specialist, Rob Haig. It's all about construction. It's all about design. It's the architecture. I, being your mortality mechanic, I'm going to walk you through this because I want you to make sure that your insurance professional or financial advisor is doing it correctly. As I've often finally been saying all of my career, if this is done correctly, it's almost indefensible, almost undefeatable. If it's done incorrectly, it's almost always indefensible. Shockingly, um, the number one expense load on a life insurance contract is the cost of insurance. Right. So it's one of the places I can actually mitigate that cost and play a little bit. So talk to me about that first, because that's the first place I can go to manage or design an efficient platform so I can actually make some money. Right. So if we're going to talk about universal life chassis and maybe you're using an index strategy, when you're trying to break down the policy, it's given. We know mm -hmm. in year one to year 50 what the cost of insurance is going to mm -hmm. be with a fairly definite certainty there. So great place to start, build back in from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say I'm looking at mom and dad and I look at dad and he's 40, let's just, just do my boilerplate, 45 male and she's 45 female. Now I've noticed, I've just noticed that females of the same age as their male counterparts, the same age, when I look at it, they're actually about eight years younger on the male actuarial table. So when I look at the cost of insurance, mom is usually the way to go. And from an underwriting point of view, she seems to get more benevolent underwriting. She'll get more preferred offers than my male counterpart. So if I don't really care about anything but making the chassis the most effective, I could let dad be the payer. He could be the beneficiary. He could do everything he wants to do, but I want mom to be the actual insured because that could be worth 35 basis points rate of return day one on the contract. Right. It's looking at all options. It's not just which one, of you know, husband, wife, whomever it may be, mm -hmm. far all lives, whatever. Look at a second to die as well. Do the policy analysis to make sure that you're providing the best income in the long run. Mm -hmm. I want to look at that because my goal is to make an effective and efficient chassis. So I'm going to pick the person that's usually the cheapest. If you go single case, uh, and I say this with a confession, I don't think I've written a mail in the last decade because generally I'm going to get better underwriting for mom and she's going to be cheaper and it's in, in, from a cost point of view. And that really makes it really zing the first 10, 15 years. I'm just adding money onto my plate here. I'm just getting me a better chance for the rate of return to be better. Now, that being said, that being said, this is going to be a shocker because everybody thinks that my, my insurance guy is always trying to sell me more insurance. In my scenario, I'm trying to buy the least amount of insurance and still comply with the 1988 uh, Technical Corrections Act and TAMRA provision. That's what I'm trying. We have a law that we have to kind of watch and we're under its jurisdiction. But I want to create that so that I can really make it cheap. Right. It's about uh, optimization, right? Mm. Would that be the correct word? Yes, actually, I love it. When you're, when you're analyzing, this is not about these large death benefits and large premiums. It's about the, the, the optimal... Um, balance between keeping it compliant mm -hmm. with the regulation and, and driving future income. Now, interestingly enough, I remember this gal, she's 45, non-smoker, I just have it in my head. I asked, what's the lowest death benefit I can buy for $10,000? Now, for $10,000, you should be able to buy a boatload of insurance, right. you know, $5 million, $6 million. Who knows, right? Term even more. Right. I don't want that, though. No. I want the lowest. So she, her number was 290000 10,000, 290,000. Doesn't sound right. But when you're trying to bring the lowest death benefit, they only charge you the difference between the money you put in and the death benefit you buy. So I want the lowest right. and still comply so I can take the money out free. So when I'm looking at that, and I noticed you do this and your team does this, you look at, hey, you look at both options of death benefit. You might even look at the different technologies, whether it's guideline technology or the cash value that, yeah. technology. You're looking to see what is going to deliver the best overall cheap chassis. Because remember, as I've said before on our show, I'm always trying to, to, to divide 
performance of the policy from the expense of the policy. Right. Well, performance is driven by expense. Um, and obviously, you know, where the investment's going to be made as well. But our team, when we've decided and determined that we are not doing this for death benefit, we right away get into the mechanics of how do we drive this as low as we possibly can, mm -hmm. run all guideline premium tests or cash value accumulation tests to make sure that we're, 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 we're optimizing. And then we design from there. And based off the carrier um, and the rating, we've got the right solution. Now, here you heard it from me first, Steve Savant, Truth Serum on the air. If my contracts, if I'm trying to do something in the first 10 years and I need liquidity, I'm not even looking at things like this. But when I start looking at anywhere between 13, 15 years out or longer, and then I'm looking for a retirement income as an example, I'm going to start looking at life insurance as a way to go. It's a, definitely a big option of mine. Interestingly enough, comparing costs to all in mutual funds and ETFs, I'm going to break even with my life insurance about the 12th and 13th year. So if I can't play, if I need money before then, I'm not even showing this strategy. But most people are more mid to long term in their thinking. So when you're trying to compare, hey, how's I, but my mutual fund has access to the equity. Well, you could do indexing on our side. You, this, this one has uh, aggressive growth funds. Oh, you could do variable if you're really into the st stock and a more of aggressive posture. So when I'm looking at this, this tells me, okay, I have some options here. And I'm ready to look at the expense loads. And it, I'm going to say it right here. It is expensive for the first 10 years, and I'm not going to say it isn't. I've driven it down as low as I can. If you're show, sh trying to compare a mutual fund or an ETF, I'm going to lose that war. But you know what the war I'm not going to win? I'm going to win it back on the tax issue. Absolutely. It's buckets of money, risk for the client, and making sure that this isn't their only mm -hmm. vehicle. I mean, this is not the end-all, be-all mm -hmm. of long-term retirement and income planning. It needs to complement an overall strategy. So you're right, long-term mm -hmm. plan, and it will win because it is the mm -hmm. most tax-effective vehicle in the marketplace. Now, remember, we've said this before when we've talked about this, you got to keep the policy in force for the life of the policy insured. Right. Have to. It's a must. And you, you know, otherwise, you're going to lose your tax advantages out of this. So let's say we're heading into, we've done our accumulation, and we bought the least amount of life insurance to keep our expense loads low. And if the contract allows us to lower it even further before distribution, we'll do that. We'll do all the things, the mechanics. And again, this is certainly, this is one of those areas where I can tell you, you cannot do this alone. You have to have a pro do this. And I want you to say that there's not that many people out there that know what they're doing. So not that I'm trying to lift us up and say we're the best, right. but we're one of the top people in the United States that actually know the mechanics here. Yeah, absolutely. It's extremely important because just because you know there's an ability to, to bring down a death benefit, if that's an option inside the contract, you're going to risk the mm -hmm. modified endowment situation mm -hmm. there in some cases because the insurance company is not always going to guide there. Mm -hmm. More importantly, there could be a hindrance or a, a deduction of pure cash value in line with whatever you've reduced the face amount. So if you were able to take it down in half, there are contracts still in the marketplace that would reduce your cash value by half, mm -hmm. and that's your cash value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to be careful, and that's why I said you need pros to do this. And think of this. The guy says, I, the, the gal I was talking about that had the 290,000 death benefits, he goes, but I still need more death benefit for my protection site. Well, I'm buying a separate contract for that. I'm not going to mix my income with my indemnification scenario. It's a pretty good, I think it's a tactical issue. Now, we're ready. We're in retirement. We're taking our money out. It's tax-free income. We can every year now. There's no auto plan on this. Every year we got to go and find out. Oh, what's our enforced ledger say? We can't take it out. There's a few carriers that have a concierge service that just came online that you can actually get on there 24/7 and say, "My anniversary is here. How much can I take out so that I don't hurt the contract and keep it in force?" Because I'm looking to take this money out for a long time. Absolutely, innovation. We continually talk about those carriers becoming part of today's times because. There's been a lack of advisory mm -hmm. once a sale has been made. It's extremely important. It is an exact number that needs to be calculated, and it's something that's done every single year. So that's another touch point for the advisor, not only to continually provide value to the client, mm -hmm. but more importantly, create an opportunity for more of a wallet share of that client's wealth because they're managing the overall process. Mm -hmm. I, and I think I would encourage you, you, you need to be looking. Most good advisors want to meet with their client anyways once a year. At least, absolutely. Once a year. So I would say this needs to become part and parcel of that review to make sure everything's online. You're always going to pull the status on your policy is called an enforced ledger. 
You're going to order it, see where you're at. Your advisor or he's partnering maybe with an insurance professional right. will be able to determine what you need to do to not only keep it compliant, but to make sure it's efficient. Listen, I go and take my car in, whatever they tell me, every 3,000 miles, they're changing the oil, they're tweaking the, the, the mechanics because I want to run efficiently. My car runs at 29.3 miles per gallon in town. Wow, because it's efficient. Well, that's our show for this week. I want to thank Rob Haig for being my special guest. But before I go, remember what the good Reverend John Wesley once said, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you next week right here on Right on the Money. For more information on this week's money topics, just go to our website at www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and follow Steve's daily postings on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. When it comes to retirement, money management, small business, insurance coverage, college funding, or budgeting, we have the interviews you can use.